Good evening, and welcome to the 2023 Dalhousie Horrocks Lecture on national, the National Leadership Lecture. We're delighted to welcome you with, uh, to our stream this evening. Uh, incredibly excited for the conversation and the presentation that we're going to participate in tonight. Uh, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Management, and many of you have heard uh, how I feel about information before, so I won't belabor the point. Um, but for those of you who are uh, new to the faculty or new to the School of Information Management, uh, three quick bullet points. One, information is cross-cutting. And so as our faculty works to take ideas and ideals and translate them into action, we know that information, data, and knowledge are centered there. We're a powerhouse in teaching and research on data, information, and knowledge. And the world is thirsty for the information expertise that we have. Uh, and so events like this and the many other events that take place under the Dalhousie banner over the years uh, reflect that critical importance of information. I'm going to begin our event formally tonight with a land acknowledgement, uh, and then I'm going to hand off to uh, Dr. Sandra Toves. I wanna to begin by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I want to pay respect to the indigenous knowledges held by the Mi'kmaq people and to the wisdom of their elders past and present. On this very snowy night here, uh, as, uh, as the trees and the lakes and the buildings are covered in a pristine white blanket, uh, and as, as, the, as the noise of our daily lives is hushed by falling snow, uh, as I am tucked safe and warm in my home office, uh, I'm especially grateful tonight to live and work on this land for which the Mi'kmaq have been custodians since time immemorial. We are all treaty people. We also recognize that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories, legacies, and contributions have enriched, enriched the part of Mi'kmaq known as Nova Scotia for over four I'm going to hand over um, to you to take a few moments to reflect on the land on which you sit and on the legacy of that land and the people that are its custodians. I'd like to take a moment to introduce Dr. Sandra Toes, the Director of the School of Information Management and the Program Director for the Master of Information Management. Sandra, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, Dean Mike Smith. Uh, and thank you for welcoming everyone. We're very excited to have you here for this conversation today. And before we started, I just wanted to, to give you a sense of what brings us all here. The event, today is both in honor of Norman Horrocks and exists because of Norman. There is the official information, the story of Dr. Horrocks. He was a former director of the School of Information Management and Dean of the Faculty of Management here at Dalhousie. He was actively involved in professional associations across the globe and was awarded many, many local, national, and international uh, awards. And he has advanced the field in the careers of countless individuals. But beyond this, for many, Dr. Horrocks was in fact the school in our programs. He was part of the team that ensured we received our first ALA accreditation. He recruited many of the key people to Dalhousie. He was our strongest advocate. As we look forward to the next generations of leaders in this field, the skills and qualities that Norman embodied remain central to this profession. He was a social networker long before social media. He always found a way to connect people and information and people to other people. He was a strong builder of community and was famous for things like his Fireside Friday chats, which we've tried to continue. To continue both his leadership and his advocacy for this field, the fund in his name supports both a scholarship and this lecture series. With money from this fund, we're able to bring outstanding leaders to our community to help us negotiate and understand the changing landscape in which we're all working. We are also able to support outstanding students. So today, we will celebrate both aspects of this. We will first have the lecture, and then we will have an award for our student. 
This year, we're very excited to be able to use this lecture to bring a critical conversation to our community. I will now bring forward or ask uh, Dr. Jamila Gadar, an assistant professor here at the Faculty of Management, to come forward to introduce our guest. Thanks, Jamila. Thank you very much, Sandra. And uh, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, Rita Chin Fu is currently the director of the National Archives Suriname. And she's been involved in a seven year project for the repatriation of the colonial archives from the Netherlands to Suriname, which is one of the largest and most successful repatriation projects on the international level. Uh, she's also a member of the Foundation for the Historical Database Suriname and Curacao, launched in 2018 after the successful implementation of the database of the enslaved people. And she serves on many national committees for the preservation of cultural heritage, as well as a number of regional and international committees and organizations um, from the Caribbean Heritage Emergency Network uh, to the International Council on Archives. And from 2015 to 2017, she was also the president of the UNESCO Memory of the World Program for the Latin American and Caribbean region. So she's a very busy woman who's uh, done a tremendous amount of innovative and inspiring uh, work, both uh, in her national context and internationally, and certainly someone who's inspired me quite a lot over the years, ever since I was a master's student many moons ago, uh, when the question came up at the Horrocks uh, committee, who to ask for the lecture, it was the very first name that came to my mind, Rita. And um, it's not a simple thing, just to let the audience know, almost uh, you know, the vast majority of countries in the world have a, an archival repatriation claim from the former colonial power in Europe. And uh, in the case of Suriname, this is one of the only uh, successful repatriation projects. So you can imagine uh, what an inspiration it is and how important it is that we hear and learn and build on this uh, extraordinary model. So without further ado, please, Rita, go ahead. Thank you, Jamila. And good evening, participants, friends, and colleagues uh, from all over the world, and also uh, uh, staff members, students from the Dalhousie University School of Information. Let me begin thanking the Dalhousie University School of Information and the selection committee for inviting me to deliver the Horrocks Dalhousie Lecture 2023. It's indeed an honor to address you and share my experiences with you all. Uh, as mentioned by Sandra, the title of my presentation is Perspectives from the Global South, Suriname on Repatriation, Challenges and Opportunities. So my slide now. So this is my title and the next. I will start my presentation with a quote from Monique Rocco. She's the Special Counsel on Heritage to the Minister of Culture of Haiti. And this uh, presentation was delivered in Yaoundé during the ICA conference in 2018. And quote, as we have all been made aware, um, Archives provide only traces with what survives, plays a dual role. It provides a benchmark of what has been done and lays a foundation for what is still to be done. One should not set goals without taking the past into account. Without a memory, people is not really free. Without history, we cannot know what we are. Without knowledge, people are prisoners of the present moment, apt to act on impulse and without the means of avoiding the repetition of historical astrosity. This quote resonates with one of the reasons why Suriname embarked on their path to repatriating their archives. So you must be wondering where Suriname is located. Suriname is a small country on the northeast coast of South America with neighboring countries, 
Brazil in the south, French Guiana in the east, and in the west, Guyana. It's defined by fast tropical forests, Dutch colonial um, architecture, and a melting pot of culture from uh, diverse uh, ethnic group. Um, and the uh, capital city, and namely the historical inner city of Paramaribo, is listed on the UNESCO World Site since 2002. So uh, in Suriname, we are, we are, it's a small populated country with 600,000 people. And uh, I mentioned already it's a diverse groups. Uh, the ethnic groups are the Amer Indian, the indigenous people, the descendants from the enslaved um, Africans, uh, we named them afro Surinams people, descendants from India, from Japanese, from Chinese. We have even Jews and Lebanons, Lebanese people living in Suriname, Europeans and Brazilians. The official language is Dutch. And Sanantongo is also a spoken uh, language. Uh, we also have the native language uh, such as Sanami uh, and Japanese. Um, and what about the economy? Our economy thrives on the following export products, um, mainly mining, oil and gold, agriculture, and timber. So the next slide. So what about the natural archives of Suriname? Before the independence of Suriname, a state archival service and the chief archivist already was established, namely in 1956. And the chief archivist was charged with general supervision of the archive management of the departments and services. In 2006, a new archive law was enacted with close support of the Dutch professor Dr. Eric Ketelaar. The design of this new archive law was part of an integ integral plan to support the Surinamese archives. And why is that? In 1996, a huge fire destroyed the archives of the Surinamese parliament, the Ministry of General Affairs, where part of the uh, archives were housed. And after this huge fire, the Dutch government decided to donate um, Suriname with a modern archive building in light of the shared heritage context or concept. In 2002, both experts in Suriname and the Netherlands agreed that a modern archive building alone was not sufficient and an integral plan was then developed consisting of capacity building, designing an archive law, management, and between 23 and 27, all these projects were accomplished successfully. And uh, that was when in 2010, the new archival building was inaugurated. Next slide. Okay, the National Archives resides under the Ministry of Home Affairs, and we are responsible for the implementation of the archival policy according to the archival law of 2006. What are our main activities? Uh, it consists of supervising the management of government archives, our, our advice with regards to their housing, their appraisal and selection, and also their transfer, um, acquisition of government and private archives, processing archives, namely the arrangement of description, the digitization, preservation, and conservation. Furthermore, um, important, very important to us is uh, also making this collection or their holdings accessible to the public um, in our reading room and to our finding aids. We also uh, uh, have services uh, with regards to the public. Uh, we organize workshops from the heritage organization, the record management here in Suriname. Uh, guiding tours, group presentations, and so on. And last but not least, that's also important to us, is collaborating with national heritage institution communities here, regional and international institutions. Next slide. With regards to our archive holding, 
It consists of paper, audiovisual, and digital format dating from 1669 till 2010. Um, and what about this paper holding or archive holding? It contains um, archives from the colonial administration from 1669 till 1975, government archives from 1975 till 2000. We also have slave registers, emancipation registers, manumission, immigration registers, and census. And all these uh, registers are already accessible online on our website. We also have immigration registers from the Chinese, the Portuguese, and the Japanese people, and also uh, from the um, India people or descendants from India. We also have private archives from presidents, poets, private organization, and we also have a large audiovisual uh, collection that's already um, online through our media bank on our website. And it's also important to highlight this audiovisual collection because besides collection from the National Tsunami TV station, uh, we also have collection from, for, uh, of culture studies with hundreds of cassette tapes consisting stories of Surinamese people from uh, Japanese immigrants to Hindustani immigrants and descendants of the enslaved people. So, and part of this audio video collection are, as I already mentioned, um, uh, on our media bank accessible. Next slide. So between 1916 and 1970, uh, the colonial archives were transferred to the natural archives of the Netherlands for safekeeping and on loan with the explicit stipulation that the archives remain the property of the colony of Suriname. And as soon as Suriname has a modern building, uh, and built according to the international standards, the archives were to return to the country. And why is that? Why did the colonial administration and the uh, archivists from the Netherlands uh, decided to transfer these archives? Because the archives were scattered um, and placed uh, in different buildings uh, no proper archive building existed in the early 20th century. And that's why the state archivists from the Netherlands and the government, government administrator decided to transfer these archives to the Netherlands. Um, on the slide, you see a picture of a ship. That's the, uh, the ship name is, was Nikeri. Uh, the ship transferred the first batch of the archives to the Netherlands in 1960. On the left is an old building that was used as an archive building. And um, yes, until 2010, when we moved to the new building, uh, the Lands Archivdienst or the Natural Archives was housed in this building that's, that was part of an orphanage. Next slide. In 2008, or two, sorry, in 2006, an article was published in a historical magazine with the title, Suriname will archiven terug uit Nederland. And in English, Suriname wants the archives to return from the Netherlands. But this was in 2006. In this article, I was interviewed as well as the former Minister of Home Affairs, Dr. Maurice Hassan Khan, also an historian. Um, when we began with the design and the construction of the new archival building, we anticipated on the protocol that was signed in 1916, stating that archives remain the property of the colony of Suriname and on loan uh, to the Netherlands. So in our interview, we explicitly mentioned that we wanted the archives returned to Suriname as soon as the building was completed in 2010. And 
this article, I think, uh, brought a lot of um, people, our colleagues in the Netherlands, uh, they were worried, I think. And maybe Aryan can address that later on. And this is an anecdote I want to share with you. It is my personal experience because from 2003 and 2004, as part of, of an archival program I did at the Dutch Archive School and the University of Amsterdam, I began with my internship at the National Archives in the E. And on the first day, I visited the deposit repository where the colonial archives um, were housed. Uh, and my eyes bulged out upon seeing hundreds of meters of these archives uh, uh, that were transferred from Suriname since 1916. I felt very emotional and I said to my mentor, Henny van Schie, these archives belong to Suriname and they must return. His reaction to me was, Rita, do you think that the National Archives will allow you to walk out of this building with an archive box under your arms? So this is a personal anecdote because when I saw these archives in a foreign, in this case, in the Dutch repository, note I had this emotional feeling, a sense of that the archives had to, re re to return. And since that time, I took it upon myself and as one of my goals in life to dedicate myself to for the repatriation of archives, in this case to Suriname. Why was it so important to us to have these archives returned to Suriname? Because it's part of our, of our nation history and Suriname's people uh, will have direct access to their archives. It has also to do with self-awareness and self-value and also nation building because who is going to write about our history? And who is going to write or identify who our heroes and heroines are? So to construct or reconstruct our own history, you know, we need direct access to these archives. Next slide. So this is a quote from a, a popular writer. Uh, uh, Sencha McLeod, who wrote historical novels um, here in Suriname. And Sencha McLeod wrote, during my study, I read the book by the famous American historian, Barbara Tushman. And quote, the statement in that book was, when people have no access to the sources of its history, those people acquire a self-image based on myths and stereotypes. And I remember well that, uh, that when I read this st statement, I sighed. And that is exactly what is happening to us. This was, this was a statement coming from St. Chad McLeod um, uh, before the archives were returned in 2010. Slide. Next slide. So repatriation engaging in uncomfortable talks and silences. There was no issue uh, from the Netherlands to return the archives to, to Suriname because it was already stated and mentioned in the protocol that was signed in 1916. But the issues and the discussion were more on the conditions, when and how. And since the Surinamese government officially sent a formal request, I think it was uh, between 2007 and 2009, th sorry, 2008, uh, we started this discussion. Um, and the issues were more on the uh, timetable to have these archives returned to our country. We wanted within five years, but one of the conditions of the National Archives in The Hague was that all the 800 meters must be digitized first and online accessible uh, to their public. 
In the end, it would take seven years to finally complete the entire process of uh, repatriation. And what about the power dynamics during this negotiation and discussions? Uh, uh, what I can say is that when we started this, uh, this, this discussion and the negotiations, there were moments, there were sometimes uncomfortable discussions and silences. But in the end, we reached consens consensus. Because, you know, looking at from the perspective of the Netherlands, for almost 100 years, the Natural Archives in The Hague was the keeper or the custodian of these archives. And I believe that they had the sense that these archives belong to do, bull, sorry, belong to them and was and was surprised to receive our request. Uh, the Surinamese ambassador in the Netherlands at that time on one occasion advised me after I had an uncomfortable uh, discussion at the Ministry of Education, Science and Culture in the Netherlands that I should not make too many demands. I have to take into account that the Netherlands held the power in their hand and that they have the archives in their custody. And she said to me that the most important task was to have these archives returned. And as I mentioned before, that the most uncomfortable discussions were mostly on the timetable, the preservation, and uh, digitization, digitization as well as access. And there was also on time from time, uh, a strained relation uh, between me and the Netherlands archivist, Martin Beren Soden. The tone of the correspondence was sometimes very harsh between us, between us but after an interference of one of the Dutch colleagues, we picked up the telephone and decided that we have to speak directly to each other when an issue, whenever an issue arises. And 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 that uh, to me was it was very helpful to talk um, although via um, mobile phone uh, face uh, uh, I'm sorry I have to drink some water yes I, as I mentioned before uh, sometimes the correspondence was very strained but after we see, decided to talk over the phone about the issues arising from this uh, repatriation, uh, in my opinion, it became um, easier. But on the other hand, most of the time, as a woman in the room, alone with these gentlemen in stiff formal suits in the Netherlands, I felt very intimidated. But I think they never uh, noticed that. Uh, that I felt intimidated by this gentleman with this stiff uh, formal suit because I knew that I had the entire country to back me up with this repatriation process. So finally, uh, in 2009, we signed the agreement to return the archives to Suriname. And from 2010 and 2017, 800 meter shelf of length archives were repatriated to Suriname and also digitized. They were immediately online accessible um, and 55 million scans um, were accessible to the public here in Suriname and also in the Netherlands. Uh, next slide. This is a statement I want to share with you coming from the uh, representative of the Tsunamis government in the Netherlands in 2017. This project, which is, which is of national importance to the Republic of Suriname, especially in view of the decolonization of the East Surinamese histori historiography. With the arrival of these archives, the people will have direct access to their social, economic, and cultural history and will contribute um, to the, no, the knowledge enrichment of Surinamese people, in particular young people. 
And I highlighted the word decolonization, national importance, the people, and direct access to social, economic, and cultural heritage. And why is that? Um, uh, I will address this later on. Um, next slide. So decolonizing the archives. Uh, the mindset, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, colonial archives are part of our nation history. But on the other hand, these archives are also testimonial of the rulers, the colonial administrators of merchants' trans transactions. So, uh, in fact, these colonial archives reflect the power dynamic between the oppressor and the oppressed. It's the story of the oppressor that will be highlighted in this colonial archive. So whose story is going to be told in these archives? Not the story of the Surinamese people, not the story of the oppressed one, the natives and the enslaved. So um, in fact, I see decolonization is the undoing of the colonization. And uh, especially since these archives serves the oppressor um, than the oppressed. And um, I also said that the mindset of the former colonized people, in this case, we the people from the South, has to change in favor of our own stories and identity. But how do we unlock our story and make them visible. Um, and for instance, uh, several weeks ago, uh, young researchers reached out to me because she was searching for a picture of her grandfather uh, with the queen of the Netherlands, uh, Queen Wilhelmina in the 1930s. 30s. She couldn't find this, this picture with her grandfather, grandfather who was an entrepreneur in the 1930s. So I asked her, what are your keywords to search on the name of the grandfather? And I told her in the 1930s, the archives, the pictures, the recording are mostly white. So you have to uh, seek for other way to search for, for your grandfather. Look at the queen visit to Suriname in the 1930s and the time frame. After one day, she called me and she mentioned she, uh, that the queen never visited Suriname. So the, the information and the way we, we seek um, a search and our finding aids, it's important. We have to look um, with another eye uh, at our archives. There are many more examples about these archives. So another concept, this is from a Surinamese historian. Uh, her name is Mildred Caprino and she used she used the diorama concept, a three-dimensional concept to look at an archival document because a document, an archive has uh, several layers. So you have to look deep enough to see or unlock your, your story. And uh, mainly because the voice of the people and storylines of ordinary people cannot discuss cannot be discovered uh, with the same concept used by the colonizer or, or the Western people. Um, we have choices to be made in appraisal, selection, and so on. So next slide. So how do we engage in this process of decolonization? And this is a quote from Dr. Stanley Griffin from the University of the West Indies in 2021 in his publication. We have to reconsider the history of the fonts, the collection, its creators, the subjects, and its themes. We have to reinterpret the content as presented in the records. Are there missing gaps or perspective? Who is silenced by these records? Whose perspectives are we missing? And in response to question one and two, we have to re-evaluate, revalue the concepts, the practices, records of the subjugated or excluded. And we have to engage and also encourage their participation in appraisal and accessioning process. 
uh, we have to ensure as natural archives from the south that all repository has the requisite wherewithal to preserve and provide access to non-traditional formats and materials. So, and last but not least, we have to act to include these funds of equal value, allowing for equity in access, preservation, exhibition, and outreach. Next slide. So looking at the Caribbean, um, over the past five years, there is a strong movement upwards uh, among my colleagues, archival colleagues in the region, as well as academics and researchers who have been writing about decolonizing the Caribbean records. For instance, in 2018, Decolonizing the Caribbean Records was published. It was an archive reader, and the editors were Janet Bastian, John Ahrens, and Stanley uh, Griffin. Um, the, the publication um, com consists of essays um, reflecting the ways who we think about archives and records from the pers perspectives of the Caribbean people. Um, and then the second publication in 2021 was on disputed archival heritage. That's what that was edited by um, Dr. James Lowry and also Dr. Jeanette Bastion. And in her the introduction, it was mentioned that disputed archival heritage speaks to the growing interest in shared archival her heritage repatriation of cultural artifacts and culture diaspora. Um, the last one, this is the also very important in 2021, sorry, 2022. Uh, it has to do with uh, the archiving Caribbean identity. And this one was edited by John Ahrens, Janet Bastian, and Sam Stanley Griffin. And it consists mostly um, articles uh, coming from Caribbean uh, people, how they record their own history, and also community archives. So there are many scholars here in the region, but also internationally, who researched and also wrote about um, uh, this, uh, about decolonization, repatriation, and community archives. For instance, Dr. Jamila. Kadar herself, um, Michelle Caswell, and also from the Netherlands, uh, Charles Jurgens. Next slide. Also on repatriation and digitization as tools to decolonize the archives. So is it the same? Is repatriation and digitization, are, is this similar to decolonizing the archives? So in my opinion, repatriation of documentary heritage is of utmost importance to people and nation who have been marginalized for a long time in history. And in order to revalue their own history, we need direct access to our heritage. But in my opinion, repatriations should not be considered at the same time as decolonization. In the case of Suriname itself, the process of decolonization of the archives started after the return of the archives, because in the first instance, it was important to have these archives um, return in Suriname. But then the discussion started. These are archives consisting of uh, testimonials from the colonial um, um, uh, administration and its interaction. It's not our story. But using digital technology technology, and for instance, transcribers uh, make them easily readable and accessible to communities in order to read and understand the document. Add the diorama concept to this document and they will be able to fill in the gaps or unlock the silence in their own history. Next slide. So archives and digital technology, engaging community to unlock memory. Um, one of my staff members uh, um, decided to uh, start 
decided to start a pilot project. And the pilot project is uh, Find Yourself in Suriname, Find Yourself, Find Suriname, using transcribers as a tool to explore and activate multifocality in archival sources. Uh, we engage the public, uh, asking the public to uh, read this document in transcribers. And in fact, uh, my colleague, Audrey Hofbex, will hold the presentation on Wednesday uh, during the info talks of the University of the West Indies. Next slide. Collaboration with community. Um, this is an example of we collaborated with a community in the Netherlands, Sarnami House, to publish correspondence letters between the descendants of the Indian immigration with their family in India. And these letters were in the archive collection of the immigration um, uh, department. So we use the subaltern me method looking for, for stories of the people and not about the Asian general of the immigration department. Next slide. So in Suriname, we see a new development where communities are also documenting their own stories and presenting it in their own method and format. We support this uh, development because um, the, the gaps and silences that are in our holdings can be filled and um, researchers also can turn to these communities or documentation center for information. It's very unique because they are documenting their own history and in a context uh, within their own history itself. We have the uh, documentary center of the Japanese people recently inaugurated uh, also online. We have plantation um, history and so on. Uh, next slide. Um, we also engage uh, archival collaboration with archival institution uh, in the Netherlands, with communities, with academics, also on national and international level. Next slide. So uh, this is also an important project about digitization of projects. Um, we started this project with the Radboud University to digitize the slave registers and also the um, Civil Registry Act. Uh, and these uh, uh, records, the digitized documents or files are already, are already online. But that we're going to a challenge. Next slide. Um, the principle of provenance for digitized cultural heritage. Uh, I already mentioned this uh, two case studies in Suriname and also in Curaçao where natural heritage of these countries were digitized and put in uh, the bases stored and hosted in Europe. So therefore their heritage was put under European jurisdiction. For instance, the open data legislation and open for commercial use, where the countries of origin, in this case Suriname and Curaçao, do not have and may not support the free reuse of digitized contents. So in our opinion, license agreements between institutions should, should be drawn up to respect the original creation, creator's right and provenance also in digitized environment. Next slide. So what are the opportunities then? We have our challenges with regards of provenance, but on the, render, on the other hand, there are also opportunities on shared heritage, or shared digital infrastructure. For instance, the regional e-repository um, could or should be set up to keep the management of cultural heritage within the reduction of the region, <coughs> sorry. And for instance, <coughs> the Caribbean archives, Cardica, uh, um, initiated a project several years ago called the Meager memory of the island um, archival networking. So this is also a way <coughs> to share this digital uh, infrastructure. And I also want to highlight this concept of digital embassy that was presented by um, Mr. David Fricker 
the former president of the International Archives, International Council on Archives, and also the vice chair of the uh, International Advisory Committee of the UNESCO Memory of the World, where Data Embassy holds its most valued records in a foreign land, but without ceding its control or jurisdiction over these records. And the concept of this data embassy could be considered as an international best practice to ensure sovereignty over Caribbean heritage. And I know that also the Netherlands uh, is researching uh, the possibility to um, begin with an e depot to host the archives of the Netherlands until of the Dutch Caribbean. Next slide. Um, I want to conclude my uh, this uh, two slides or the next three slides about repatriation and um, um, also with reparation. Uh, the chair of the Natural Reparation Commission, Arman Sunder, spent years in archive collecting data to calculate the size of the reparation. And um, for instance, the damage uh, Suriname and its population suffered from colonialism. Uh, and in his publication, Herstel Betalingen, he calculated uh, how much the Netherlands um, has to pay uh, for, for this damage or the suffering from colonialism. But in his publication, he also mentioned about the accessibility of the, the archives that's so important to uh, rewrite our own history. It's about the value we are going to give on the, these human lives. It's not only about economic on the development, but it will also shed light on the structural system of mental slavery by design, the divide and rule, the history and culture of indigenous and Africans um, that were wiped out for centuries. So it's necessary that repatriation can be considered as a form of repatriation. Next slide. Um, and in that sense, um, in this context also, I have to say on repatriation and repatriation that the Netherlands Council for Culture demonstrated their willingness to return the looted art and artifacts in the report of 2020. Um, and in this report, the advisory committee explicitly mentioned that the Dutch art, uh, government has to return the art treasure stolen by its subjects during colonial times to the countries of origin, in particular to Suriname. And furthermore, the Dutch Advisory Committee also gave the mandate to the Council of Culture to form a subcommittee to prepare a return, a report on the return of archives that were stolen and also belong to the former colonies in 2022. And last but not least, because this is very important, that was also the statement um, and the apologies that was issued by the Minister President of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte, um, uh, about the slavery system. And, and I'm quoting him now. With this ap apology, we are writing not the full stop, but the comma. The dialogue on the history of slavery should be held as broadly as possible, not only in the Netherlands, but also and especially in places where it happened, with everyone who is involved or feels involved. So repatriation of the colonial archive doesn't stop when the repatriation um, already happened. That is a follow-up uh, about the rep reparation process. Next slide. So this is my next slide. And this, um, I added a question mark in there because after hearing the story of the repatriation um, of the Tsunami's archives from the Netherlands, um, I also, and this is my opinion, that as archive professionals, as colleagues, as 
uh, academics looking at this repatriation process that as archive professional, we have to learn from this su success story and engage in this difficult conversation with each other. Because as archivists, we have a task to make the uh, archives accessible widely and also to advocate. And, um, and I do believe that there's a role for the International Council on Archives to uh, to start and to engage with the international archival community because there are several cases in the world with regard to repatri repatriation where it's difficult to start the conversation. And um, I just want to finalize with uh, my presentation with uh, you know uh, asking and also requesting the international archival community to, and also the um, academics, the researcher, to collaborate with each, with each other and engage in this journey of repatriation and reparation. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Rita, for that incredibly uh, thought-provoking talk. Uh, and listening as you know, someone in Canada, when I think of the work we have to do and, and the work that needs to be done internationally, uh, your leadership and your example uh, is something that we can all learn from. Uh, so I'd like to, first of all, invite everyone in the audience to start thinking about their questions uh, and posting them, and we look forward to that. But as, you know, as the story has unfolded and we recognize the many voices that had to take part in this discussion uh, and the way things became, came, uh, unfolded, I would like to invite Ariane Ajima from uh, the Netherlands uh, to, to respond uh, to Rita's talk and provide uh, yet another perspective. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I say hello from the Netherlands where it's uh, past midnight almost. So uh, I'm up, uh, you're still with us. Um, I would first like to thank the colleagues at Dalhousie University for organizing and hosting this important Horrocks event and that they have chosen an excellent speaker for this event, an important thinker in archiving, the National Archivist of Suriname, a well-known partner in the ICA and in Garbica, and not least at all, a long-time friend and colleague of the National Archives of the Netherlands and of myself. It's an honor to be able to give a short reaction to Mrs. Rita's Jin Fu's presentation. Um, the, re the repatriation project of the uh, Suriname archives from the Netherlands was also for us a very important project with the aim not only to repatriate the Suriname archives as completely as possible and well restored and preserved, but also to share the commitment with the National Archives of Suriname for digitization and accessibility of these documents. For us, there were several concerns for returning the archives without doubt or hesitation. Would Suriname have the building of good quality to safeguard the paper documents? Would staff of the uh, Suriname archives be available and well trained to care for the material? Um, would the material, uh, sorry, um, I lose my sentence. Um, would Suriname have the financial means uh, for accessibility through a content management system or a website? Would the material well handed over to Suriname not be locked up um, and withheld from the public? To just hand over the archives uh, and not care what um, and not care what would happen with them was no option option for the National Archives of the Netherlands. On the other hand, was it for the National Archives, or for the former coloni colonizer, to pose any conditions on returning what was Suriname's heritage? As Rita explained, 
many words have been spoken to reach an agreement which was satisfactory for both sides. And this led indeed to a happy end, returning the paper material to Paramaribo after digitizing all of it and sharing the scans with both countries to ensure availability for as many researchers and members of the public as possible. With the need for decolonizing the archives, Rita has pointed to an important issue discussed in many an archival institution. What struck me in the presentation was the fact that she lies responsibility for decolonizing both with the archival institutions as well as with the users of the sources. Indeed, the finding aids written in the past and probably also in the present are written from a perspective of the dominator, the white male, given hardly any attention to the colonized, let alone that their stories or their views are represented in these archives. We as the Netherlands uh, National Archives, being a government institution, taking care of government documents, realize the stories told in these archives are far from the Dutch memory. They are only the memory of the privileged and the rulers. Indeed, much has to be done to rewrite these finding aids and go through the steps Stanley Griffin has proposed to make them accessible for representatives of these marginalized communities and to get a more complete and multivocal picture cooperation between archival and heritage institutions and communities is at the essence. But the content of the archives can, in many cases, not be changed. They are what they are, put together many decades ago. Detaching ourselves from concepts and methods for the formation of archives in the West cannot be undone. That's wishful thinking. Therefore, we should not underestimate the role of the researcher using the imperfect sources. I agree with Rita that the mindset of the researchers and the users has to change in favor of the stories of the communities and the underprivileged. And archives should be unlocked by these researchers and users to reveal the voices and experiences of the marginalized and those who so far have not been in the center of scientific and genealogical research. It is a shared responsibility of both archival institutions and users to facilitate to seek the, for truth and justice, given equal attention and weight to different perspectives in these sources. The anti-racist anti and inclusive moment, which became eminent with Black Lives Matter, demanding their rights to be seen and to be heard, should be an inspiration and a driving source to both institutions and researchers to enhance accessibility, reform finding aids and archival descriptions, and rethink important research themes and perspectives. At last, uh, a last point I want to raise is something Rita brought up in her presentation. On the one hand, she applauds the return of the Suriname archives to Paramaribo, since it gives the people of Suriname finally the possibility to have full access to the, what is their heritage. And digitization of the material has led to an enormous increase in the, in the uh, findability and usability of the material. On the other hand, she seems to agree that under local jurisdiction, some archival material might not be as available and, and, uh, or accessible as it would be in other countries. In the discussion of repatriation of archival material to places where it has been formed, whether it's in Suriname or in Indonesia or any other country, it is a major concern whether the repatriated material does not end up in a closed repository, no longer accessible for researchers. In the repatriation debate and practice, open access should be the leading principle and the precondition. The idea of data embassies might be an interesting solution to the different sides in this debate. Thank you very much.
thank you very much to both of you. I think you've given us so much to consider and to think about. Uh, and I just wanted to start, uh, this has been a, a very complex and, and long process. And there's multiple stages uh, as both of you have, have uh, discussed. But I just wanted to, to, to get a sense of whether you had recommendations, you know, for other people that are, are starting on this process, uh, you know, how can they benefit from your experience? You know, what have you learned, uh, you know, that you could sort of come up with uh, one or two key things that you think are really important to achieving some of the things you've been able to achieve. Thank you, Sandra, for your questions. Indeed, how do you start? How do you engage in these difficult conversations? So the main uh, point is to have an open communication with, uh, for instance, in, in my case, the Netherlands. The conversations will be strange, but as, as a people from the South, you have to and, and this also goes two ways, also uh, to the Netherlands, that we have to be respectful on the one hand. But on the other hand, we have to take into account and also be aware that the, uh, there are different interests. Uh, the Netherlands serve a different interest and Suriname also serve a different interest. So how to reach uh, consensus? It's very difficult and it took us years to finally mm -hmm. Uh, sign this agreement, and and um, I'm not sure if Arjan have some points because that's important to me. Open communication, and also the willing the willingness to solve the issue of repatriation. Because that, because as archive professionals, and I mentioned it before, we have a role and a task to make this archive a sex act accessible uh, to everyone and also advocate that that's also our, our task. Yes, yeah, well, I, I can add from, from our side that um, I think um, what I also said a little bit in my reaction, it's, it's, it's uh, on the one hand very obvious that you want to cooperate and to give uh, back what is, in this case, Surinams. Um, on the other hand, it's it's also from an archival point of view, uh, very tempting to state all kinds of conditions. Uh, like mm -hmm. I said, on on uh, the, the the climate uh, um, in 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 the repository, on um, the, the 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 way people are working in the national archives. Um, and um, it, it, it also comes back to us being mm -hmm. the former colonial uh, uh, power um, that it's not, in fact, up to us to state all these conditions. Yeah. So, like Rita said, it's, it's the way you communicate to overcome these stereotypes and to get to the real things which have to be solved. And in that sense, um, I think we have been very privileged to work together and um, make things um, happen the way they have happened. Um, for us, um, it was very important, I think, also to realize um, the emotional attachment or the emotional uh, needs which um, these archives um, we're, we're an example of and and um, it's not always a daily work for an archivist to be uh, having attention on on these emotional sides it's mainly paper with interesting uh, information or they are even beautiful things but mm -hmm. um, I, I once had the ambassador of, of australia in our repository and we have um, uh, the, the, the Abel Tasman journal uh, in our collection and well of course he had seen it many times in copies uh, but then when I 
where we could show him the original. That it, it was really an emotional moment. So we have to be very aware of the strength of these documents and the importance of keeping them at the place where they should be. Oh, I think that's absolutely critical. And uh, Rita, from your talk, I, I really appreciated the emotion that you brought to this topic. And, and it just, you know, it, it makes it so much more important that these are not just documents. They're, you know, so important in so many different ways. Um, we, I, we now have some questions from the audience. So I will bring up the first one here. Uh, the first one is, since we are on the other end, as the memory institutions of an ongoing settler colony, what do you think are some of the most important steps to take to break this cycle and decolonize our archives? So uh, thank you very much for these questions. Uh, the most important thing is to be aware that the, that the archives, the documents are testimonials coming from colonial administrators and also merchants. Um, Aryan mentioned, it is what it is. It's a story of the oppressor. But, you know, when these archives return to Suriname, we look at this archive, 5.5 million scans. And how are we going to um, rewrite our history in this huge, uh, yeah, millions of, of scans. And, you know, our, our um, uh, researchers were also, and young people were also um, requesting to do research in these this archives, but they were not able to read these archives, read the documents, because they are in old handwritten texts. So what we decided, and then as on the as an organization that is important to be aware that these archives are stories, uh, testimonials from the colonial administrator. And we have to break that cycle, uh, you know, and start to look with another eye, with another view at these archives. It, it's very um, difficult and challenging, the awareness of the organization itself. And normally, because I studied um, in, in, in Europe, uh, and, you know, um, we, we, we teach this Western concept, so mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, to, to detach yourself from, from the Western concept and look as um, as, as people from the South and these archives, the self-awareness as an organization. And then um, and the next step also is to look for ways, methods to uncover and refill the stars because it's in there. For instance, in the uh, archive collection of the notariat, there are several, uh, there are thousands stories of enslaved people in there. So, you know, I'm not sure if this uh, answered the question. Yeah. No, I think it, uh, it absolutely did. And I think uh, one of the things that really impressed me during your talk is, you know, just your sort of calmness and graciousness with the way you approach these very challenging topics. And, uh, you know, it, it you know, being able to do that uh, is, is, you know, just incredible. Um, so just, uh, you know, a few other questions. Um, our Dean is asking, I am intrigued by this idea of a digital embassy. It is a useful analogy. It sounds a bit like a data trust. What are some of the next steps in exploring that option? So thank you very much uh, for this question. Um, Dr. Mark Smith, uh, this concept of digital embassy, this was presented, as I mentioned before, David Fricker, and indeed it was uh, a concept that was introduced in Estonia, and they decided to 
post their data elsewhere. And in fact, just like an embassy in a different country with their with the, with their own jurisdiction, um, uh, that was an option for them. So, what are the next step? We have to explore uh, this this uh, concept of digital embassy because it was introduced and as researchers and academics and archivists, we have the task to research this uh, concept of digital embassy further. What about the legislation, the jurisdiction, the jurisdiction? So there are many aspects of this digital embassy that uh, we have to research still because I think in, it was introduced in Estonia, but where else in the world? So maybe this is just an example how it can be done and especially also uh, for um, countries coming from the south. You know, I, I know the Netherlands is also exploring this uh, concept of e-depot for the Dutch Caribbean, but I'm not sure if it's the same as the concept of digital embassy, uh, Arjan. Yeah, well, we are still in, 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 uh, in, in a phase to explore it. I mean, we have our uh, e-repository, our e-depot, um, built over several years, so it's, it's quite an investment and it's quite a technical challenge mm -hmm. to keep it up running and to, to put all these petabytes of, of scans and, 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 and metadata in, in, in that. Um, we know there is a possibility to, to make tenants within such a, a depot, so we are now looking for uh, ways to connect some of our um, national archives within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. For instance, uh, we have now made a, a memorandum of intention with, uh, with Curaçao. Um, but we are in, indeed, like, like Rita says, we have to figure out the uh, ju judicial uh, boundaries of, and, and possibilities. We have to find technical uh, things. Uh, I mean, we have people in the Netherlands who understand uh, uh, an, an e-depot very much, but we also need someone in, at the side of, of Curaçao who at least can be a spokesperson to our technicians. Um, so these, these things are very challenging. Uh, there are, of course, financial aspects. Um, but in, in, the, in, in the end, the idea is to um, come up with a cooperation because it really doesn't matter in, in the all uh, web-based infrastructure or the digital infrastructure where the data are hosted. Um, it can be done anywhere. So in that sense, you can look for a cheap way, but then be aware of um, responsibilities and ownership and things like that. So um, we look forward to have the um, experiment with Curacao and we uh, very much would like to share these experiences with anyone who is interested. Thank you very much. Another question from the audience, um, from Kristen. Are archives from other nations coming to you to discuss your success so that they can modify their approach uh, so that they may also achieve success in their rape, uh, repatriation projects? So thank you for the questions, uh, Kristen. Um, yes, I was approached by a colleague from Archivos, uh, Africa to share my uh, story and my experience of the repatriation process also with him. And um, also um, another colleague was Mr. Jamai Batal, uh, I think he's from Algeria, who also approached me uh, to share my experiences with him because also Algeria, he, Algeria also had as a um, issue with repatriation of their archives. So, you know, every country and every repatri repatriation process is very unique. So I think um, the case of Suriname and the Netherlands, 
um, is an example that looking at other um, uh, case studies that was published in the um, Disputed Archival Heritage, edited by James Lowry, there are so many countries in the region, Africa, um, Asia, and also from the indigenous people, indigenous yeah. people coming from Canada. So each um, uh, quest for repatriation is unique. We can share or I can share um, my story on the repatriation process. And I gladly will do that. But I think the most important thing is to start your start to engage with your colleague from the other side from from the global north start the conversation begin with that conversation and see how that that will go and it and if you um are uh, and if you are confronted with challenges i um suggest that you reach out to the expert group on shared archival heritage from the International Council on Archives. And you have so many scholars now. People like our scholars like Jamila Gadar, Mike Michelle Caswell, and then so many more. Because there are a group of people who are daily busy with this mm -hmm. repatriation process. So I think we are step closer. It's a long journey, but we are a step close closer to engage with. Uh, some of the Western um, Western European countries or the former <coughs> colonies. Yes, P thank you I very can, much. Oh, go ahead. I can add a little, a little, just a little bit. I mean, what what made it fairly easy between the Netherlands and Suriname was that there was no discussion on the claim itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, mm -hmm. the, the 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 ownership of the archives held in the Netherlands was not disputed. So it was more a discussion on the how and the when than on, on the what. And yeah. um, as, as Rita uh, uh, points out, uh, in, in the expert group, there are many cases of real disputes on right. uh, the provenance and where these archives should be. I mean, if we look um, at, at, for instance, uh, Kenya, um, the UK has taken nearly all of the colonial archives from Kenya and, and keeps them in, in Kew in, in London. Um, and the accessibility of the, the, the work is, well, not as good as we would hope for. And the Kenyan people when, who, who want to do their research really have to go to London to see the material. So that's a whole other discussion on a much more difficult level than I think the Netherlands and Suriname had, even that we had our discussions as well, of course. But um, I, I would say there are still many steps to be taken to, 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 to get all these claims uh, Settle so we, we still do have some questions, but we have to be mindful of time. So I'm going to have to close the question and answer at this point. Um, but I did also want to share that uh, Dr. Stanley Griffin uh, did send a reaction and uh, so wanted to pass on his words. Good presentation, Rita, and response um, from Ariane. Always inspiring to hear the journey of this particular repatriation experience. We have lots to learn from this model. Bless. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the conversation here shows that uh, this is just the beginning of hopefully uh, a, a forum. To, to continue to move these very important discussions forward. So I'd like to thank both of you very, very much uh, for your spending your time with us uh, and, and talking about these very critical uh, topics. So thanks again. And we'll give you a, a virtual round of applause. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. And so now we are 
joining the final part of tonight's uh, program uh, and uh, to to introduce our student and to uh, to give the uh, the, the student award, I would like to ask Norman's daughter, Sarah Horrocks, to come forward and say a few words. Uh, and just to let you know that Sarah has also been a key part of our community for many years uh, and is herself an alumni, uh, completing her Master of Information Management with us. Uh, so Sarah will now present the, the, the award to our Master of Information student, Maddie Hare. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here tonight, and thank you uh, to the school for giving uh, me the opportunity to attend and present this award on behalf of my family. Um, we're so thrilled uh, that Dalhousie continues this tradition every year in our father's memory. Um, just a little bit before I, I, I introduce Maddie, just to, to reiterate what Sandra said at the beginning. Anybody who knew my father also knew that um, he did like to connect people. He was very um, prideful of his adopted country of Canada, but he did have a lot of national pride um, from his birthplace in the UK to the time that he spent in Australia and also in the United States. So um, the talk that was just given in the national pride that was evident um, in, in the recapturing the archives from Suriname, for Suriname would have really touched a chord with him. Um, so one of the things that um, dad was able to do across all of these uh, countries was he um, belonged to a lot of professional associations and that was one of the ways that he managed to extend, extend his social network and his ability to connect people. Um, and similarly, when I read um, the description of the student, Maddie Hare, who was the 2022 recipient of the Horrocks Award, I noticed that she too participates in a variety of um, roles across the information kind of workspace. So she's working or interning at the Kellogg Library, where my mother also worked. Um, and she is involved with Peer 21. She's been a chair of the student, uh, School of Information Management Student Association. And she also helped develop learning resources for SIM courses. So um, I'm sure that, Maddie, whether you decide to continue and pursue your doctorate or whether you um, move forward in working in the information field, um, we are just thrilled as members of the Horrocks family to be um, part of your journey. And we hope to congratulate, wish to congratulate you on uh, receiving this award. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah, and to the Horrocks family, um, and to Sim and Rita for your lecture. Um, when I first started at Sim last year, two of my friends, Mackenzie Young and Vincent Lee, received the Horrocks Award. And uh, qualities that I admired in Mackenzie and Vincent um, were their devotion to their work and their commitment to their peers and community and their kindness. Um, they always left the door open for students to ask questions and provided myself and my peers with um, encouragement and guidance and models of what skilled and caring information professionals could look like and ones that we could see ourselves in. So um, it means a great deal to me uh, that I was recognized for qualities that I greatly admire in people I love and respect. Uh, it's a great honor, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and congratulations once again, Maddie, and uh, we know you will go on to do incredible things, and we are excited to watch your journey. So as we wrap up this event, uh, just wanted, of course, to say a thank you to many people uh, who, who allowed us to, to bring you this uh, event tonight. So thank you to Kim Humes with SIM uh, and to our incredible support from our alumni team, from Shelley Lamour and Lori Bald, and also Nicole Mansell uh, for all their work behind the scenes to make this uh, as seamless uh, as it has been. Uh, and very much thanks to uh, Dr. Jamila Gadar once again uh, for bringing uh, this topic in this area to us and, and for really uh, connecting us to Rita and Arjan and uh, creating this opportunity. Uh, so, I really um, 
want to encourage you to stay in, uh, in touch with us and to take a look at our website for upcoming opportunities. Um, details of the Horrocks Award and how you can contribute to it um, will are available on our website and we are happy to take any questions that you might have. And I would like to thank you for attending and to tell you to stay tuned for uh, another enlightening uh, event next year. And I also just wanted to encourage, uh, you know, any members of the audience, uh, you know, we're happy uh, to take your ideas and thoughts about who you, who you would like to hear from. And, you know, this is very much, since we've turned this to a virtual event, uh, we are looking to support a global conversation. So any ideas you have, uh, we're happy uh, to, to have. So thank you very much uh, and have a good evening. And for those of us who are in Halifax, uh, have a safe, uh, have a safe evening.